for me. Heidi, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, but you kind Becky, of sound like Becky, you sound muffled. You actually sound like muffled. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, shoot, then I have to switch computers. Um, tell you what, let me get um, things rolling. I'm going to turn it over to Heidi and I'll switch computers before I have to speak again. How about that? <laughs> Um, so feel free to use the chat box um, for questions and um, if you want to introduce yourself, uh, name and where you work, um, uh, what brings you to the COBA meeting, and that would be great so we can kind of see who's in our audience. And um, Heidi, let me just uh, turn it over to you to um, yeah, go through introducing partners and board members and so forth. And I'm gonna Perfect. And we will come back to um, it's our vision and our values. I'm Heidi Russell, and it's a delight to be with you today um, on this fall day here in Oklahoma City, um, which it is feeling very much like a fall day here. So um, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, and we're really excited that we have several folks who um, will be joining us um, after our meeting for our Maternal Health Matters panel discussion. And we're really excited to have folks from all over the state for that panel discussion. Um, I joined COBA um, almost three years ago, I guess it would be two and a half years ago. And um, you all as a community, the lactation, breastfeeding, human milk community um, are incredibly welcoming. It has been an absolute pleasure to serve as COBA's um, first executive director. And um, we have incredible partners. Um, just want to list some of the folks who we work with on a regular basis. Um, the United States Breastfeeding Committee. Um, COBA is um, Oklahoma's nonprofit breastfeeding coalition that is affiliated with the U.S. Breastfeeding Committee. Um, we work very closely with the Oklahoma State Department of Health and appreciate all they do to help advance our mission. Of course, WIC here in Oklahoma, Women, Infants, and Children, and Preparing for a Lifetime, um, which is um, Oklahoma State Department of Health um, initiative to, to help um, um, advance better outcomes for, for mothers and, and families and, and women here in Oklahoma. Um, of course, the Oklahoma Mother's Milk Bank, which is affiliated with the Human Milk Banking Association of um, North America. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, the Oklahoma Breastfeeding Resource Center. Um, we also work very closely with um, the Oklahoma Perinatal Quality Improvement Committee, March of Dimes here in Oklahoma. The Metropolitan Library System is a new partner of ours. And then um, the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy. We also have several folks who financially support our mission. The Masonic Charity Foundation of Oklahoma, the Robert Glenn Rapp Foundation, the W.J. Jones Family Foundation and Presbyterian Health Foundation, in addition to several of our corporate um, partners that are listed, NBC Bank, Innovations, Lactation and Breastfeeding Services, Amshot, Your Feeding Friend, Quail Creek Bank, and Bank First. So I think it looks like Becky is back in, is that correct? All right, is that better? Oh, that's better. We can hear you much better. Uh, yeah, I gotta get something fixed out there, so. All right, is it back over to me? Um, Here we go, it is back over to you. Um, so, I'm just looking on our agenda. Oh yeah, because you're on the slides and stuff. So yeah, so yeah, hopefully um, COBA's mission is to um, promote, protect, and support breastfeeding in Oklahoma. And um, our vision is a state where all children have access to human milk. You can see our values there. Um, 
uh, we've really worked on inclusion and diversity. And of course, we've always I've been a firm believer in evidence-based practices as well, but family empowerment, respect and compassion uh, as well. So um, I think Heidi, it's, yeah, you've done the partners. Um, yes. Um, and I will introduce our board of directors. Um, we are grateful to have folks from all over Oklahoma um, who represent um, COBA within their communities. Um, Deandra Opoku, who is with the YWCA of Tulsa. Jerry Ann Thomas here in Oklahoma City, who is an attorney and a breastfeeding mom of three. Our vice chair is Julia Prophet, otherwise known as JP, over in uh, Cushing, Oklahoma. Cheryl Coleman hails from Verdigree, and she spent most of her professional career at Hillcrest in Tulsa. She serves as our secretary, and she also serves as our newsletter editor. So every month when you all receive um, that great COBA newsletter, you can give a shout out to Cheryl and friends. Our wonderful treasurer, Alexis Baritzia. Um, Alexis is um, a breastfeeding mom of four. And when she's not um, helping COBA, she is running carpool literally all over the state of Oklahoma. And you probably have seen her at either a wrestling tournament or a baseball game. She is a super mom. Um, Lily Beth Sanger Brinkman, um, Oklahoma City, represents NBC Bank. Erin Kopenbarger with March of Dimes. Rose Hurd is in Tulsa. And then Kelsey Watkins um, is over in Tulsa. And at this time, um, we would like to give a big shout out to Aaron and Lily Beth, um, both Aaron and Lily Beth, they complete their um, service to the COBA board this year. And we are so grateful for all that they have done. Um, they will not be gone at all, um, but um, we, again, thank you so much for all that you do to advance um, our mission within the community. And it's so bittersweet because Erin Kopenbarger, in addition to rotating off the COBA board, um, she has recently moved um, to St. Louis, Missouri for an incredible opportunity with her husband's company. But the great thing is um, she will be continuing her work with March of Dimes. Um, so um, just thank you so much. And I put these photos of both Lily Beth and Erin and their kids because um, they are just incredible um, mothers. They are incredible um, community volunteers. And again, thank you so much for your service. Um, I hope you all have had the opportunity um, to recently go to COBA's um, website. Um, COBA uh, worked with AmShot, which is a company here in Oklahoma City. Um, we were fortunate to receive a grant um, from the city of Oklahoma City to work on some um, updating of our communications efforts, and that included a new website. So um, we hope, again, you've had the opportunity to go to our website. We hope that you feel that it is more user-friendly. Um, wanted to just kind of point out some of the features um, of our new website. Um, you will see on the home page um, a um, like rotating kind of header, and that will depend on what's happening within our lactation community, specifically what's happening. Um, in Oklahoma, whether it's National Breastfeeding Month, whether it's Pinot and Pints for preemies. Um, we hope that um, our homepage will be um, a source of information for um, uh, what's happening, um, you know, readily in Oklahoma to, to help advance your mission. And then we've also added, um, a really easy way to navigate the breastfeeding, our breastfeeding site and to get some breastfeeding resources um, for your team. You'll find that we have, of course, our breastfeeding um, law cards. There's also a way that you can order law cards. Um, these are free 
Um, the law cards are free for you all through the Oklahoma State Department of Health. Um, you can order them through OSDH or you can contact us at any time and we can help facilitate that order. Um, the breastfeeding law cards are updated to include um, last year's important law about SB 121, which is for um, breastfeeding persons who are public school employees in Oklahoma. And with that, on our website, we have our Working Moms Work Toolkit for breastfeeding persons who are employees in public schools in Oklahoma, um, which now um, breastfeeding persons receive um, a paid break throughout the day. So special thanks to Senator Perry Hicks and our wonderful legislative um, champions who have worked really hard on, on that bill. And then of course, uh, another program that, that we partner with with the Oklahoma State Department of Health is the Breastfeeding Friendly Worksite um, Recognition Program. Um, you can find that on our website. In addition to um, different policy positions and policy statements, um, um, including COBA's um, new model infant feeding policy. Um, in addition to um, those updates, our scholarship application is now online. Um, so when you go to the about um, part of the website, you can scroll down and you can see information about our scholarship program. Again, you can see where you skipped the application. Everything can be filled out online and all required documents um, will be uploaded and sent directly to here to COBA. Um, our next deadline is January 30th, and that is for the IBCLC exam fee scholarship. We pay for the entire exam fee, which is $660, um, but you need to complete the application with all required documents before January 30th. If you have any questions, you can always um, email the office at info at okbreastfeeding.org. And with that, we would like to introduce um, our two most recent scholarship recipients who are both um, recipients of the IBCLC exam fee scholarship, uh, Natalie Hooks Peterson with Tulsa Birth Equity Initiative and Kristen Booker with Chickasaw Nation Nutrition Services. Congratulations to both these ladies. They, um, they took the exam in September, so we have our fingers crossed for both of these ladies and are just so proud of their accomplishments and what they're doing and will do with their advanced education in their communities. And at this time, I would like to introduce Alexis Baritzia, who is COBA's treasurer, as previously introduced, and she will talk to you a little bit about COBA's recent um, strategic planning session this summer. Hi, good afternoon. Um, yeah, so COBA did uh, recently put out a survey and we also surveyed our board members to see um, what COBA's priorities should be as we move forward with our new strategic planning. And we found that our job is to advocate for breastfeeding families around our state. Um, if we wanna go to the next slide that identifies some of our yeah, there we go. So we had the opportunity to be back in May at the YWCA in Tulsa um, with Daniel Billingsley, who is the chief, chief encouragement officer with Charisma Strategy Planners. And he helped us kind of create this new uh, three-year strategic plan for COBA. Our priorities that we identified are going to be um, we want a board that reflects the diversity of Oklahoma families. So our uh, committee recently got together and we said that we're gonna do this um, by identifying gaps in our current representation. This is gonna include gender, gender, race and ethnicity, as well as geographic. Um, I didn't you know this guy, uh, I didn't you know this guy. Uh, and he told me that they counseled it, but we have uh, Alexa, sorry to interrupt. Um, if everyone that's on the Zoom call could mute themselves, um, we're getting uh, somebody's side conversation. You probably don't want us to uh, repeat what you're saying uh, publicly. Thank you. 
Okay, I think we're good. <laughs> so we were able to um, identify how we can, you know, fill in those gaps in our current board representation um, and make sure that we're we're reflecting Oklahoma's population as a whole. Um, and we really want to identify those two to four new board members within the next calendar year. Um, our next uh, big priority is that we want to make sure that our advocacy is current with state and national lactation initiatives. We don't wanna be working on one thing when you know all of our other states surrounding us are working on something else. Um, we wanna make sure that we're aligning with current things. Um, we're gonna go ahead and remain active and current with our statewide lactation initiatives that have already gotten started. And we want to do so, uh, hang on. my own notes are very tiny and I am very, uh, okay. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. So we want to remain active and current with statewide lactation initiatives so that we can increase the awareness and understanding of Oklahoma's needs. Um, and we want to do this through education, annual reflection and reporting, and care provider surveys. Um, we want to make sure we're asking the people that are directly working with lactating families what those gaps are and how we can assist them. Um, we also want to make sure that we're putting out an annual report so that we can let you guys know what we've accomplished. Um, next, alliance building with partners that share our mission. Um, we're going to continue to foster those relationships with lawmakers to advance policy that reflects our mission. We also want to create and distribute advocacy materials to health professionals, as well as a policy agenda that can help assist in pushing those um, policies forward. And our, our board is set to approve our new strategic plan here in early November so that we can go ahead and share it with everyone else. It'll be posted on our website. We'll make sure that when our newsletter goes out, you're also receiving information on it there. So just watch out for that. Um, and then we've also identified which committees we think should be working on each of these priorities and the tasks that fall under each priority. So if you feel that you know, you can help us assist and obtain any of these goals, please email us and reach out and say, hey, I think that, it, you know, you guys could benefit from my assistance here. We'd love to add you to a committee. That's all I have. Thank you, Alexis. All right, back to me. Yeah, thank you for that, Alexis. And um, uh, yeah, she said once that gets posted on the website, hopefully, uh, some of you in attendance today might identify something that um, that you can get excited about and that you want to help us move forward. So having that um, uh, clear direction for our organization, at least for the next few years, um, will steer us in the right direction. So and now coming back to our advocacy roots, um, something literally that we've been working on for more than 10 years. Uh, in various um, iterations is getting some form of Medicaid coverage for pasteurized donor human milk from our Oklahoma Mother's Milk Bank. And uh, we're uh, still waiting on the final, 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 final signature. <laughs> uh, fingers crossed. But the healthcare authority has actually budgeted for this. And while our um, Senate bill did not um, make it all the way to the final vote it needed, the healthcare authority went ahead and um, ran the numbers uh, because of our work on the legislation and fiscal impact statements and so forth. And they said, you know, we don't need legislation. We can just put this in our budget because this is a win-win for um, our state. And so, uh, so that um, is part of the package that's actually on Governor Stitt's desk right now. And he has until November 7th to um, sign that. And once it's signed, um, then, um, yeah, we will be informed of, you know, how to actually put this into practice, but this is specifically covering safe pasteurized donor human milk for babies in the community. So babies that are not hospitalized, because if babies are in the hospital, um, they should have access to um, donor milk through the um, hospital setting. But once they get discharged, there's not any coverage. So we're, yeah, closing that gap and babies that have a medical necessity, um, you know, maybe get a prescription from their physician um, or their provider and um, uh, the milk bank will work with them. So um, I think that's really all on that, Heidi. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. Oh, and thank you. We had, um, of course, uh, Senator Hicks was the um, uh, lead author on our Senate Bill 469, but we had uh, bipartisan support and we had um, bipartisan support in both houses of our state legislature. So we are very um, happy to um, continue to have breastfeeding seen as a bipartisan issue um, and a family issue as well. So uh, so thank you to everybody that's listed there and all those um, who did vote um, in favor of the bill at the time. So lots of support. All right, um, Heidi, if you want to yeah, move on. And then um, our other um, program that, yeah, you've seen a little bit of um, updates on this in our um, COVID newsletter, but we have been working with the Department of Corrections now for gosh, two or three years. And um, uh, once again, with Senator Hicks, as you see her there in the picture, uh, kind of taking the lead and helping make contact with key people at the Department of Corrections. But we actually took um, uh, Heidi uh, and myself, Senator Hicks, and then that's um, Frank Lawler, who's um, logistics coordinator at the Milk Bank. And we toured Mabel Bassett Correctional uh, Center and we will be, um, uh, we're eagerly awaiting kind of finalized direction from the Department of Corrections on how to uh, put this program into place. The COBA has some, uh, thanks to Heidi's good work to get some uh, uh, seed funding so we can help them with supplies and freezer and things to uh, support any incarcerated mothers to pump and provide milk. And then the milk bank will work with DOC to get that milk shipped out um, to the baby um, wherever, um, whatever care setting that particular baby is in. So uh, we hope to have this in place, um, I think by uh, the first of the year. So we're very, very excited um, about this program. Um, all right, Heidi. Um, yeah, I think, are we ready? Yeah, if any um, carrying my yeah, questions from, from people. With me. So, Every class did, but if I get one of those bigger file holders okay. or something to carry it in, we have someone else who can find conversation we can hear and we carry my card ever. Uh, All right, uh, so we'll, yeah, we have a few minutes um, before we move into um, introducing our panel session. And uh, if people have questions, you can unmute yourself and ask a question or raise your hand um, or put something in the chat box if there's a question about anything that we've covered today. And while we're kind of giving you time to think of that, we also um, wanted to uh, give a big shout out to Nancy Bacon, who's been a longtime COBA member and um, health department um, uh, employee who's been our kind of main um, liaison through the Oklahoma State Department of Health and Maternal Child Health uh, in the Maternal Child Health section. And she just recently retired and we had um, a nice um, retirement luncheon for her that was very well attended. And she has been involved um, in COBA for many, many years. And um, we hope that uh, she will stay involved. We're not gonna let her go too far away either. So um, so yeah, have we, yeah, any questions from anyone on the information that we've covered or Heidi or um, anybody seeing anything in the chat box? see. Yeah, thanks to Nancy. Yeah, I'm not seeing any um, questions from anyone. And I didn't see any hands raised. Becky, is there anything that, um, because I know you serve on the Habana board, the Human Milk Banking huh? Association of North America, huh? is there anything that you would like to um, relay to our audience today in terms of human milk banking? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, actually, on the uh, federal legislative front, um, there have been a couple of bills introduced uh, in the past few months. Um, and so you may hear about these. The first bill that was introduced um, earlier this year is called the um, Donor Milk Quote Safety Act. And this um, uh, bill was actually heavily sponsored by Prolacta, a for-profit milk bank um, organization. And 
uh, and they had um, gotten, and, and there was no communication with the Human Milk Banking Association of North America or Havana, who oversees and accredits all the nonprofit milk banks, the 28 nonprofit milk banks in the United States. Uh, so there was no communication to Havana. This bill came out of nowhere. And it would actually um, ask the federal government to regulate uh, donor human milk as an infant formula product, uh, as an exempt inf infant formula product, which is completely inappropriate and would actually um, lead to all kinds of uh, rules and regulations and testing that would shut down all the nonprofit milk banks. Um, so, uh, so Havana has been working to um, re-educate <laughs> uh, about the, the potential harm from this legislation and at the same time uh, work with federal legislators to introduce um, a new bill to increase access to pasteurized donor human milk. And that's called the Access to Donor Milk Act. And um, yeah, I know I just have another minute here. And we actually um, have bipartisan support. That bill just got introduced last week. So of course, nothing will happen until after the election. But you'll be pleased to know that our own um, Congresswoman Stephanie Bice is one of the initial authors on that bill and um, spoke about the fact that we have the Oklahoma Mothers Milk Bank, and this would be a bill that would help support our nonprofit milk banks, help us um, also survive if there's another pandemic, if there's another formula shortage, some kind of crisis, um, and so, um, and would help and would encourage the FDA to clarify that donor human milk is actually correctly classified currently as a food um, and not an infant formula product. So that's kind of really on the Havana um, front right now. So you'll be hearing more about that, um, I'm sure, next year in next year's Congress. So, um, and I didn't see any other, yeah, questions um, in the chat box. So Heidi, we have a minute or so. Do you want to you turn it over to you? Yes, we are going to um, just break for literally one minute so I can just do a couple of housekeeping notes here on my computer and um, then we will start our maternal health matters panel discussion um, right at 12 o'clock, which is almost um, coming around the mountain here. Okay, Becky, take it away. All right, let me get my next. All right. I don't have much of a job here this time. 
Uh, so let's see, Heidi, do you have um, slides you're pulling up? Um, so welcome to our HOBA Fall General Meeting and Maternal Health Matters um, panel discussion, which we are very excited about. Heidi will be doing introduction of our speakers, but um, those of you that weren't in attendance for our um, business portion of the meeting, which we just concluded, just to remind everyone that um, uh, COBA is our nonprofit state uh, breastfeeding coalition. We're a member of the U.S. Breastfeeding Committee, which uh, kind of it gives guidance to all of the state uh, nonprofit breastfeeding coalitions around the country and includes also um, tribal coalitions and another a, a number of other um, organizations. That our mission is to promote, protect, and support breastfeeding um, in Oklahoma, and our vision is a state where all children have access to human milk. So, um, so Heidi, let me turn it over to you then um, to uh, introduce our um, moderator and our um, speakers today. And Heidi is um, the executive director for COBA. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Hannah Ralston to you all as our moderator. I met Hannah three years ago, almost three years ago, um, in 2022 when I first joined COBA. And my good friend Shelly Academy in Tulsa, um, when she learned um, about my joining the Coalition of Oklahoma Breastfeeding Advocates, she said, you need to meet my friend Hannah Ralston. And at that time, Hannah had a brand new baby and had, um, had a wonderful breastfeeding experience. And Shelly said, you and Hannah need to meet. And so Hannah and I connected and... Um, I am so grateful because Hannah, um, Hannah, she can tell you her story, but um, at the time she was working with the, uh, for the Tulsa Health Department, she now works at Tulsa Birth Equity Initiative and is a direct result of um, her breastfeeding experience and going through the doula program there at Tulsa Birth Equity Initiative. Hannah serves as the hospital quality improvement officer for Tulsa Birth Equity Initiative, where she provides ongoing training and technical assistance to key hospitals in Tulsa County. She's a graduate of Oklahoma State University. She brings a decade of program management and process improvement experience in nonprofits and the public sector. She also trained, as I said, as a doula through TBEI and serves on our policy committee for COBA. Um, Hannah is absolutely delightful to work with. She is super smart, super hard worker, um, and it is honors um, our organization that she is our, um, our, our moderator today. Thank you so much, Heidi. I am really excited to introduce our panelists um, and, and guide this discussion today. Um, one thing to note, Heidi, I think as the host, you are able to pin the four of us um, you should be able to pin the four of us if you hover over those three dots, if you want to like keep us front and center for everyone. If not, that's okay too. Um, want to introduce our panelists, Lori Applecamp, Dr. Kate Arnold, and Dr. Cassandra Quirdipiti. Lori Applecamp both began her career with March of Dimes as division director in Tulsa almost 19 years ago. And in 2016, she became the executive director of market development for the Oklahoma City market, which encompasses the entire state. And in 2012, she was named one of the most admired CEOs in Oklahoma by the journal record. Lori earned her Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from Cameron University, and she also holds her Oklahoma Teaching Certification in Business Education and received Advanced Certification in Community Relations from the Center for Corporate Community Relations at Boston College. Her passion for March of Dimes is very personal to her. It began with the birth of her son, Tyler, who is now 30 years old. He was born more than a month prematurely, and now he is an NFL long snapper with the Seattle Seahawks. Um, so I know there's a really amazing journey and story that they as a family have gone through with that experience. And Lori loves spending time with her husband, uh, their dogs, her son, 
uh, her stepchildren and her very soon to be five grandchildren. I think she is jumping off a little early today so she can meet that newly arriving fifth grandchild. Uh, Dr. Kate Arnold, uh, MD and MBA, completed medical school at Georgetown, followed by her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. She stayed on staff there for two years before transitioning to Director of Women's Health at Variety Care, a federally qualified health center in Oklahoma City that provides access to affordable health care service to all people, regardless of age, medical history, immigration status, or insurance coverage. Community involvement is incredibly important to her, and she participates in many committees and co-chairs the state's Maternal Mortality Review Committee. In her free time, you can find her at home with her wife, their five kids, and their two dogs. And Dr. Cassandra Quirtabitti is a PhD and MPH. She's a citizen of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma and descendant of the Muskogee Nation. She earned her Bachelor of Science from Oklahoma State, an MPH in Health Promotion Sciences from OU's Hudson College of Public Health, and then received training as a Health Promotion Specialist from the Oklahoma State Department of Health before continuing on to get her PhD in Health Promotion Sciences. She was awarded the Health Promotion Sciences Department Doctoral Student of the Year in 2020, and she currently serves as the Tribal Epidemiology Center Core Program Manager with the Oklahoma Area Tribal Epidemiology Center at the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board. She also chairs the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma Health Board and the Indian Health Service WeWoka Service Unit Health Advisory Board. She chose the public health field because she is passionate about health and well being of Indigenous people. So I think it's fair to say that everyone here on this panel, probably everyone here on this Zoom, um, comes to this work with a passion and interest. So I'm really excited again to, to moderate and get a chance to learn from these amazing women. So we'll go ahead and, and kick it off. Um, obviously, there's a lot of great work that's being done in our state, but according to the 20, 2021 Maternal Mortality Review Committee report, Oklahoma does rank 40th in maternal health in the nation. We know we have a lot of contributing factors. There's a 19% uninsurance rate for women. We have a maternal death rate in Oklahoma that is 23.5 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And looking at the data from 2014 to 2019, Black women have a maternal death rate that's about three times that of white women in Oklahoma. So for our panelists, from your perspective, what is the biggest issue facing maternal health in Oklahoma and how can we take steps to address it? Let's have uh, Dr. Arnold, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I know you asked for one. I would say there's two right now. I think uninsurance, like you mentioned, is huge. We are lucky in that most patients, once they're pregnant, have insurance, but a lot of patients are coming into pregnancy very unhealthy and haven't had insurance to address their health problems before that. And if you're starting out pregnancy unhealthy, you're really kind of already behind the eight ball. So insurance is huge um, in the medical problems and then also just in access to contraception so that people can have babies when they want to. Um, and then the second thing that I want to mention, which I think is really um, timely right now is, you know, the, the legislative environment here in Oklahoma is driving away providers. And I think that needs to be at the front and center of how we think about things. We have so many maternal um, care deserts. We don't have enough providers already. And then when this legislation is introduced that goes for criminal offenses, jail time, monetary fines, all these things, it's it's not gonna keep residents here to practice, it's not gonna draw people here and it's gonna make people ultimately leave, which is gonna be so, so detrimental to our patient population. So I'm sorry to be a downer, but I just, it's with the legislative stuff I think is, is a big hit for, and it's gonna be one that keeps going for years and years at this point. So. Hi, can I, um, I, I appreciate you guys being understanding. I am at the airport to uh, head to Seattle for the birth of my granddaughter. 
So I apologize that it kind of timing wise, but you can't really plan those things, I guess. Um, but I did want, I might go off camera when I'm talking some, but I just wanted to tell you guys what was going on. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. But in the regards from, you know, March of Dimes perspective right now, the U.S. remains one of the most dangerous developed nations for childbirth, which is really crazy to say that in the United States that we're one of the most dangerous to have a child. Um, two women die from pregnancy related causes every day. And that more that number is almost doubled over the last 30 years. And here in the U.S., two babies die what? every year, every hour. Devil's tech every guys. hour. As as he's eating and so, drinking, I think we're okay. But go ahead and put him in tomorrow. Oh, and shit. just as a note, if you are not one of the panelists, if you could keep yourself on mute, please. I think also what we see here in Oklahoma is we have a huge disparity in birth outcomes uh, for our black families. Black women are three times more likely to die from childbirth than what white women and black babies have a 39% higher chance of being premature. And it's not necessarily uh, a race issue as far as why white babies versus black babies. It's really about what Dr. Arnold was talking about is the quality of care, that the competency of quality health care for women to feel like they're supported and that they can ask the questions and they can feel like that um, they understand what they're going through. And really in Oklahoma, we need more black providers and birth workers in that area so that that would help those women. Um, and hopefully we would see a decrease in the number of babies that are being born preterm um, in the black community. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. Uh, Dr. Cordovity, any, any thoughts on the biggest issues facing Oklahoma? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this group of phenomenal women. This is great. Um, I think uh, it's already been touched on, but access to care and uh, lack of funding and resources. Um, it's a little bit different. Um, as far as Indian Health Service, um, they're only funded at 55% of the need. And so they have to do more with less. And so um, also American Indians are the only group of people with the right to healthcare. And um, I think that the misconception behind that is the healthcare equals to insurance. So if so, I see it all the time in surveys they collect that and they automatically say, oh, well, they're insured if they use tribal or Indian health service, which is not health insurance. That does not equal the access to care. Like you can only go to certain areas and potentially, so say you have an emergency and you take your child or you, your personal self, um, I can use me as an example. If I were Indian Health Service user and I ended up going to a different place that's outside, maybe I go to Baptist or something like that, and I try to get them to pay for my bill, well, they have a list of criteria and tiered things of priorities. And if I don't meet those, then they can deny it. And then I'm stuck with that whole bill as an uninsured individual. And it just it keeps going and going. So it's just a lot of lack of access to care and lack of funding and resources. And also, which means if they're funded at that low percentage, then we have a lot of old facilities. We have a lot of old equipment. And as you know, everyone is well aware, like technology is always changing and those things can't, aren't able to be integrated within these old facilities. And um, also here in the lack of providers, that's also an issue. Um, another thing, there's already a, a distrust of, you know, in the government, especially any health services that's providing these things. Um, you know, it comes down to forced sterilization that happened in Indian Health Service. And there's also the policies, the historical policies behind removing um, American Indian children, things like that. So there's a lot of distrust and bringing in providers. A lot of times they're remote. You know, Oklahoma is very unique in how we're set up. But, you know, overall, if we look at reservations, how remote they are, so they have to bring in, you know, entice, you know, incentivize bringing providers in and having that student loan repayment, which is amazing and great. But basically what happens is we have people come in for four, five years and then leave and then we're back where we are. So um, just really speaking to, I heard before is, you know, basically training um, citizens, uh, making sure they have access to that, streamlining those areas to where they can come back and give back to their own community and, and serve them. 
Yeah, thank you. So much, so much great information that comes out here. And I, I love what you said, Dr. Pertibidi, that, you know, insurance does not necessarily equal quality care. Just because you have access to the insurance, there can still be challenges associated with that. And even as individuals with private health insurance through a workplace, there can be challenges with making sure you're accessing in-network care and not getting those surprise costs. So definitely understand that and, and the challenges that come with it even more from the rural perspective. So building off of that, how can policymakers really prioritize maternal and infant health? And, and I want each of you guys to answer this. And I know you have really unique and different lenses um, because you're kind of working on, on different spheres and different perspectives of those policymakers. So maybe Dr. Arnold, from your perspective, um, is there something that hospital or healthcare policies can do better uh, to really prioritize maternal and infant health? Well, I mean, I think I already mentioned, obviously, the legislative things that are a barrier from um, like an overall healthcare perspective. I think um, it's not just an Oklahoma problem, but nationally, we just underestimate the amount of difference that support staff can make. I think we go so quickly from like healthcare to what can you do for doctors or how can you get more doctors or support doctors or something like that. And, um, you know, I love getting support, but it still makes me one person and really like you need more people, you know, it doesn't um, like, obviously I'm staring at Becky Mantle right now. And, it, you know, it doesn't make sense for um, me to like crunch my contraceptive discussion down. And so that I can tell somebody how to breastfeed when there's an expert in that. Um, I've tried that and I'm terrible at it. Um, and so I think really using, um, like that whole idea of wraparound support. And some hospitals are really good at it, some aren't, and some are good at it for a little while and then not. But, you know, there are so many creative ideas if you look at all the, I know managed care has pluses and minuses, but managed care has so many good solutions for making everything easier for moms. And we're just not good at using those creative solutions. It's all either like you came to your appointment or you didn't come to your appointment. And really there should be a lot in between there of having people who are, following up if you miss a prenatal care appointment, you know, better access to breast pumps, better access to lactation consultants, whether it's in-person or virtual, um, even care managers. I've had patients where I've literally done the whole visit, thought it went great, I addressed all their concerns, and then a care manager comes in and is like, actually, she really wanted to talk about this, and the patient just had a really low um, health literacy and didn't kind of realize what I could help her with. And so we had talked about the wrong thing. Um, and so I, to me, I think it's all of those support people that we do not utilize and do not fund and do not value enough. Yeah, absolutely. Building that collaboration and, and leaning on community partners, partners and experts. Um, Lori, if you're available to talk right now, any perspective from the like state or national legislators, what they can be doing better to prioritize maternal and infant health? Oh, you're still muted. Sorry, there. There I am. Okay, sorry about that. Um, you know, for us, I, I, I totally agree with what Dr. Arnold is saying. Um, we've really got to work with our policymakers, too, to make sure they realize the need that's out there as well. Um, more nurses, doctors, better access to care. But as Dr. Arnold was saying, is, you know, there just aren't enough of everyone. Um, the pandemic put a strain on those healthcare workers and so and the healthcare system. And I think we've got some positive things happening, like extending insurance through the first year of postpartum will be huge for Oklahoma. Um, but a lot of the maternal deaths or the majority of the maternal deaths are happening after the 60 day mark. So when postpartum Medicaid typically ends. So we really got to work with the legislators, educate them on what's going on, what we need, allowing more nurse certified midwives fully practicing uh, in those hospitals as well to allow those women to have somebody to hear their concerns, hear their issues, 
and also relieve some of the pressure that's on those doctors and the medical staff. So I think education and working with our legislature to make sure we can we can have policy that's really going to address this issue is going to help a lot. Yeah, definitely making sure they understand and have access to the data and that like human interest and why this is important. Um, Dr. Quirtabitti, any thoughts? Absolutely, on, absolutely. You know, yeah, any thoughts on what you would love to see from local or tribal leaders on how to prioritize maternal and infant health? Um, I'd like to put a disclaimer out there. Um, we do work for Southern Plains Tribal Health Board and we do do some advocacy and, and we serve the tribes in Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas. But I personally uh, don't, I cannot say what they should do. I don't like to speak on their behalf, but um, just some ideas and I don't want to repeat what already uh, has been said, but obviously, you know, I've mentioned it before, which is be funding, but I think what would really help uh, tribal nations is really um, tribal sovereignty, uh, really honoring that and supporting that in a, in a good way, um, in an honest way. And I think, um, tribal nations and leaders, they understand their communities and they understand their need um, better than we can. Um, even though I'm a citizen of a Seminole nation, I don't even feel comfortable being able to say what uh, is best for the community that lives in Wewoka and, and Seminole. Um, so those types of things. Um, also, if we're thinking about uh, tribal sovereignty, that also includes a whole other realm of data sovereignty, uh, making sure that there are data points that tribes can uh, leverage and for funding and so that they can bring in dollars to be able to address social determinants of health, you know, really get on the health equity. Because what was previously mentioned is, you know, we're mothers before we're actual mothers. And so our health starts way before and if we're not getting the care that we need and getting things, um, you know, the preventative part of public health, the reason why we're here um, is we're, we're not, me as a public health, and you always got to think about it, like, well, how am I different from, you know, the clinical side? Like, that's later on, that's that tertiary end. I want to get it at the beginning, look at those social determinants, health, food insecurity, food deserts, things like that, and um, address those things. Because, you know, we have chronic diseases that are a result of those. But, yeah, it's just really tribal sovereignty, data sovereignty, giving them the data points. Um, it's always hard to hear, well, the sample was too small, you know, so you're just invisible all over again. So um, just making sure that tribes have access to the data they need so they can build their own eternal capacity and serve their community in the, the, in the way they know how to. And they, they do. They've done it forever. I mean, historically. Um, based on the policies that have came about, I mean, we were never meant to make it to 2022, to be real honest. And so, you know, there is resiliency in that and tribes know their communities best. Yeah, I love what you said of like looking to the people for the answers. And I think that's that's come up a lot um, for for both you and, and Dr. Arnold is, is the patient um, knows best. They know their experience best. I'd, I'm curious, um, Dr. Cordobetti, if you can talk a little bit more about this, this data sovereignty piece. That is a new term for me and maybe for some others on this call. So I'd love to know um, what, the, what the definition of, of data sovereignty is and, and how we get there. Well, if you're looking at uh, tribal sovereignty, it's kind of saying, which I guess is a new term for a lot of different people. So I think it's, um, so tribal sovereignty, we should start there. So basically tribe, tribal nations are their, their own government. So it's a government within a government. And then there's this weird dynamic. So basically they're even higher than the state, in my opinion, they're at the federal level. And so there's this relationship and there's this agreement that much, that's why you hear about compacts, contracts, you know, things like that. They're treaties, they're, but they're government to government relationships. And then, so anytime like data comes from tribal citizens, you know, that is citizens of another government. And so they, that's their data. They should own that. You know, they should have influence. They should say how to interpret it, you know, things like that. And it's kind of interesting, even when you think about art, you know, or cultural practices, 
you know, with uh, culturally, it isn't individualistic and it, it belongs to a whole group of people. So kind of really think them up about that. And it doesn't just end up, doesn't only belong to the individual, but it belongs to the greater behind them, the, the whole community as a, as a whole. And so anytime we're collecting data with, uh, for American Indians, that's why uh, it's very important to look into in, um, IRBs. Um, some tribes have their own. I, IHS has their IRB. So just making sure that well, we are respectful and honorable and going through those channels. And, and even tribes that don't have their own IRB, um, even bringing it to their health boards. Most tribes do have health boards and making sure that they're reviewing that and that data is collected um, in a way that isn't gonna bring harm. And also, like I said before, this data should be used by the tribe to leverage and to um, apply for their own funding. So what that means is they have to also have input on what's collected and how it's collected. And also historically with indigenous people, we do this all the time. I have to rewire my brain because that's just how I was trained. Like we always do it in a deficit. Like we're always, I mean, that's how you get funding. So of course that's how it's going, but we're always talking about people of how bad they are, um, what they're doing wrong. But what are those protective factors? What are they doing right? How can we um, how can we really show that and show the strength of a community and build off that and get to the grassroots and understand you know this is what it is. Let's you're doing this great. Let's just really emphasize and encourage and promote and just keep. I don't know. It's hard to do, like I said, because that's just how the systems work and that's how we're trained. And but if you have a a tribe that's involved and always influencing how you're collecting things, then you're more likely to do it in a good way and that's going to represent them well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for expanding on that, that term. I think it's really helpful for us to understand that perspective and, and realizing that, you know, even on the data collection side, um, data analysis side, it's really important to have the voices of those who are affected um, at the forefront of that collection and analysis. And, and you've talked about a lot of the ways that that can really happen um, from the, the tribal perspective. So thank you for, for giving us that additional information. Um, Lori, if you're able to come off mute, uh, what role do you think that nonprofits and community organizations play in addressing maternal health disparities? If you're there. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think today what we're doing, what Heidi and Becky have done by bringing the, um, all of us together to talk about this is a huge step in the right direction and what we need to continue to do. Um, I think collaboration among all of the nonprofits helping each other, we're all small but mighty groups. And so we can only accomplish so much with just the the staff we have and we have to rely heavily on the uh, volunteers and so I think it's really important that we continue to work together and collaborate to figure out what is the best thing that we need to do what are our needs in Oklahoma what do we need to go and talk to le uh, legislators about you know go and be at the Capitol as one big group to talk about what our needs are what we need the more people that we're telling that we're telling the legislators, the more that are there visiting and saying, here's what we need in our community. You know, if we really need to see policy change and some of this is policy change, then that's what we're gonna need to do. So, you know, again, thank you for bringing this group of people together, continuing to learn and figure out what each of us need and how we can all work together to make that happen. Because a big group of people like this are going to make a difference and are really going to open the eyes up of legislators on what we need to do if we're, if we're seeking policy change. But we really have to look at um, how we can continue to do that and, you know, listen to the families and the mothers, you know, what are they experiencing? What are their needs? How do we need to address those? Because they're the ones that are being affected. We might not have been affected and we need to hear the stories about what they've gone through and how do we implement change. Um, that's what we're all talking about doing is implementing change right now. So what are we gonna do to make that happen? 
Yeah, thank you. I think that really takes that broad perspective of, of raising our voices together to make sure that we're heard um, as, a, as a coalition, as a, as a collaborative. For Dr. Arnold, how can, taking it back to like the more micro level, how can providers ensure that they are really understanding a patient's concerns, you know, when they're there in the office with them? You even mentioned that this happened to you recently where someone came in, uh, you gave her a lot of information and great resources and later realized that wasn't maybe best suiting her needs. So how can providers do, do a, a better job of doing that? And, and how can providers hold their peers and, and other physicians accountable um, if they see that they're not doing a great job of, of listening and, and understanding patient concerns? I mean, I think those are hard questions. I think um, one thing is that I think just the way that we listen to patients has a lot of bias in it. Um, I think we, we all know that, you know, providers, most people tend to take people maybe more seriously based on how they're dressed, their education level, their race, all those kinds of things versus taking people less seriously. Um, and that's not okay. We need to work against that. Um, I think one thing that, um, as Lori was talking um, about kind of like the bigger issues, um, one thing that, that does come into the difficulties when I'm talking to patients personally is like that patients just come in so uneducated about their bodies and about health concerns in general that communication is more difficult. And that is not at all meant to like put the blame on the patient. It's just, if you're looking at like bigger picture, it's not only that we have, um, <clears throat> The, the low insurance rates and rank 40th in, in health issues, it's it's then you combine that with our also low rating for education. And again, not to come at teachers, teachers are wonderful. They're just under-resourced. Um, and so I think, I think it's an uphill battle. I think it's full of implicit bias. I think, honestly, the first step is probably most providers need to accept those two things because I think there's still that concept um, I think in some of our like older school providers of just, you know, I don't see race or um, I treat everybody the same. And, and we all know that's just not true of any provider um, for any person. So um, I think accepting those things goes a long way. The other thing is that I think um, we need to, as providers, take into account the context. Um, I remember learning this in med school from an doctor, <laughs> but it's like, my daughter is like the, my 16 year old has all kinds of like weird complaints, right? It's like my thumb hurts, my chest hurts, whatever. And for her, like it's at home, she's just telling me casually, like, I don't do anything about it. She gets better the next day, it's fine. And then there's like somebody who comes into the office for their scheduled visit. And maybe they say like, yeah, I'm struggling with some chest pain and I give them some heartburn medication. And then you have somebody who comes into like OB triage or the emergency room with chest pain. Well, obviously it'd be totally inappropriate for me to be like, go home, I'll, I'll see if you're better tomorrow or, or anything like that. Even if the patients look exactly the same and don't present any differently, we have to take into account the context. Um, and I think a lot of times as providers, we think that patients are just mentioning it kind of like I talk about my daughter, like, you know, oh, my chest hurts. When really patients are coming into the office, like, hey, I've been meaning to talk to you about this. It's been bothering me, like, please help. Um, and so I think more provider education about that would help. I also think, um, and we mentioned it briefly, I think it's really hard to be a good provider when you're burnt out. I think there's lots of evidence for that. I think we get terrible at listening to patients when we're burnt out. And I think when you combine um, COVID and the strain that that had with the legislative efforts, it just is um, leads to really, really high rates of burnout. So not to let providers off the hook. I do think um, we need to be good at listening to patients. Um, and I think that, again, everything ties together. Getting more of those support staff to take off, things off that can come off of providers' plates will make us better listeners, listeners ultimately. Yeah. What I'm hearing from you is that it's it's there's a lot of challenges there in, in the implicit bias that's really baked into the system and inherent in all of us. Um, as well as kind of our, our low 
educational and, and health literacy challenges in Oklahoma, which is a, a result of you know, policies and, and these systemic pieces that we see. Um, but the providers are also feeling burnt out. Um, I, I, I know from, from working with providers in my role that this has been an incredibly tough time in healthcare. Um, the past two and a half years, probably the most difficult time in anyone's, anyone's memory. Um, so any, any thoughts or advice, Dr. Arnold, on what you would tell doctors who are feeling burnt out, how to take care of themselves and how to make sure that they're, uh, again, engaging them in, them in that self-care so that they can be their best selves for the patients and really listen? That's a good question. I mean, I think there's so much discussion about wellness and, you know, that it sometimes is sold as like a scented candle in a journal or something like that, and that that really doesn't actually make you feel better um, long term. Um, I think I think um, one of the things that happens with burnout is that you don't feel empowered, right? And so you just kind of feel like stuck and, and dealing with the day with, with no um, impetus to, to change anything to make you better at your job or make the situation better. And so to me, I think a lot of times that's the first step is like, what do I am burned out? What do I need to do? And taking that step back and realizing there are things that, that you can change that um, can help. And that might be things that are changing jobs or changing part of your job. It might be changing things at home, whatever it is. But I think, I think the, you have to kind of move from that um, external sense of control, which is like the burnout that life is just happening to me to that internal, like I need to fix something because if I'm not bringing, um, I'm not being the kind of doctor that I want to be at work, then that, that shouldn't be acceptable. Yeah, thank you for that. We're having a few questions pop up in the chat, questions and comments. Um, and then I also, I realize Becky is raising your hand. Becky, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Yeah, thanks, Hannah. Um, lower that. Uh, and yeah, really kind of for anyone in the group, I think, because um, um, I've heard pretty much everyone talk about the, and this is maybe a bit of a rhetorical question, but social determinants of health, which you know, from a, many of us are in public health or the healthcare system, and we we get that. But I wonder. I sometimes kind of get the impression, you know, when you mention social determinants of health, maybe to legislators or something, you know, you get a little bit of I don't know eye rolling or or kind of you know blame the person. You know, it's their fault that they're in that category, and why do we need to make extra effort to try to help them and uh, so I don't. So I don't know any any thoughts or perspective on that on how to help people really better understand what we mean when we kind of throw out these terms and how that is it has a huge huge impact on people whether it's healthcare or or education and public schools and things like that. So. I know when Hannah initially asked me that question, she asked me on a micro level, and I feel like I ended up talking way more macro level. But when I'm working with residents and I feel like the care is not where I would want it to be. The easiest way for me is just to say, you know, if your mom called you after this visit, would you be happy? Because um, for whatever reason, sometimes the answer is no. And then it gives you two points. It gives you the like, fix it right now. Like go give that patient a visit that you would be happy to hear that your mom had. And then also you need to think about why was that okay for that patient? at first, like, why did I think that would be okay? When really, if I think about my family, I understand it's not okay. Um, so it's not at that that bigger level. And I saw um, Lori pointing out the implicit bias training. It's 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 more like you have to be able to confront that feeling of, of and it's a bad feeling of like, why was that okay for that patient? And it wouldn't be okay for my family. But I think that's where you can really get some insight into your own bias. Yeah, I think that's such a great, a great question to ask of residents. Like, would you be happy if your mom or your family member received this care? Would you be proud to tell your mom about this visit? I think that's such a powerful question and really personalizes things. Dr. Cordovity, I'd I'd love to to hear from your perspective too. You had um some some great things that you had mentioned on kind of our our systems and you know 
the, the distrust that exists in indigenous and black communities um, due to forced sterilization and, and just kind of decades, centuries of mistrust that have been built up. So I'd love to hear your perspective on Becky's question. Becky, will you ask your question again? Sure, sure. And, and I, it was kind of rhetorical, but just when we've been talking about social determinants of health, and of course, Dr. Arnold's great example of trying to personalize that, but how, how does that, and maybe to um, personalize or, yeah, modified a bit for you in the um, uh, tribal community, I just, I, I get the perspective when I talk about social determinants of health and maybe I'm giving a talk or I'm work meeting with legislators or, you know, a little bit of the eye rolling or either they don't know what it is or they discount it or they think we make too big a deal out of it and not, how do you communicate the importance of addressing these underlying issues that we roll into that public health term of social determinants of health? Um, and not just, you know, blame the person. It's your fault that you're low income. It's your fault that you, you know, can't get transportation, whatever. Um, so how do you, how do you change that perspective that some people um, seems to have, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. That is a hard one because we say it all the time. We throw it around social determinants health. We got to get down to the root, but I mean, conceptualizing that, how do we do a good job or better job? Maybe we're not doing a good job at really conceptualizing and defining right. and measuring that. Um, uh, and it could be anywhere from income, education, you know, access to healthy foods. Um, I like to think more of the system level, like these policies in place are the reason why we have X, Y, Z. Or, I mean, we used to talk about all the time. You see, you see, um, dollar stores, they call them, but it's dollar generals in all rural areas. And you're starting to see them uh, with grocery stores and things like that. And I think if that's where areas they're going to be in, then I think they have a responsibility to provide healthy, <laughs> healthier food options. I mean, that's just me, but um, that's a policy level. Like, I don't, you know, that's really hard, Becky. I don't know. How do we, how do we do that? And normally it's like data and I really don't know how we do that. I do want to comment on the implicit bias. I went to a conference. I went to a city match. Uh, it's a maternal child health conference. It was in Chicago um, a couple of weeks ago, and they did a national study on the PRAMS data, and they were looking at that question about uh, the standard of practice, the topics they ask women, and uh, so they found that um, not all, you know, these are all topics that all women should be talked to about. Um, obviously there's some bias and recall bias and all that stuff, but what they did find was kind of interesting and it kind of speaks to it and it almost provides evidence of it. But um, so American Indian women were more likely to be talked to about alcohol and substance abuse and um, black women were more likely to be talked to about HIV. And so there are things that have trickled down, but I wonder if that's our fault, because I think about congenital syphilis and that third trimester screening. And I can't wrap my mind around it because we're trying to work on that and we're putting the burden on the mothers. And I don't know that messaging. And it's weird for me because, you know, the message is high risk populations or should receive the third you know, trimester screening for syphilis. Well, because I'm brown, I should receive that third trimester screening. So it's really odd and how we shape that again, back to messaging and how, uh, you know, we are basically, I think we're kind of a part of the problem about this, you know, implicit bias and things like that, because that's how we start doing it. And then it becomes a standard of practice. Um, I get the reasoning behind it. It's really related to access to care and things like that, but it's just like really hard. And I think that we do need to do a better job at defining those things and really providing some good, um, data that we all use across the board to describe that and 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 it's uh I, again i prefer to do those system level things like what was set in place that has caused this so we're a part of the problem how do we become a problem a part of the solution how do we backtrack that and empower people to take control over their own health 
Yeah, I think so right. And I mean, I feel like it's not publicized, but you know, it's college educated white women are the people who are most likely to have babies with fetal alcohol syndrome. It's not even Native American women. Um, and I bet that if you look at like likelihood of screening, white college educated women are probably some of the least likely people to be screened. Um, and so <laughs> it's, it's not just, um, we just like trade people on the wrong group even, it's not even helpful. I think really when you look at, um, and I know you had this on the agenda for if we had time, but I think we know so much about implicit bias and we know that we're always wrong, right? Like, <laughs> and we know that it, it leads to worse outcomes for most people, not better outcomes for most people. And so to me, I think in medicine, we really have to take that, that those decisions off of clinical people. Like it needs to not be the RN's job to decide if somebody needs a UDS or not, or a physician's job to decide who needs that screen. It should just be everybody. Um, and we have worked to do that here at Variety Care. I think it's, um, some people think it's costly, you know, it, and sometimes you are like, I just don't think this problem, this patient's probably at higher risk for third trimester syphilis, but we order it on everybody because the minute that I start making decisions, it's probably gonna go poorly. Um, and so to me, we have to, we have to be teaching not so much who's at risk and who do you test for, um, and more just doing it for everybody or doing it off of standardized questionnaires. Yes, I think there's there's so much to that of like universal screenings and realizing, you know, that race is not a, a biological factor. It's really these systemic factors that we we've talked about as a result of, of policies and um, access to insurance and healthy foods and affordable housing. All of those pieces have kind of led us to where we are today. Sorry, I'm trying to read the chat. Yes, treating people as, as individuals, not as situations or circumstances. I think that's such an important piece. Um, and, and that is a challenge, I know, in our, in our current healthcare system, just given the amount of time that an individual patient has with their provider. Um, any thoughts on how an individual patient can really maximize their time, best advocate for themselves and get, um, get the answers that they need. Obviously, the, we've, we've talked so much about the systems approach, um, but as individuals, is there, is there something that individuals can be doing to best equip themselves uh, for success in that provider's office once they're there? I see some nods. Dr. Arnold, any thoughts on that? What I would you tell like your patients? I feel like Dr. Am I saying it right? Cordobiti? Cordobiti? Yeah, Cordobiti. <laughs> it's not right at all. Huh? So, um, but I feel like you were like, I don't know how to help them communicate and be heard. Um, I will say there's been, um, I've had two patients I can think of that, that gave me some insight. One was a patient who was struggling with all these like weird vague symptoms like um and like saying yes to everything that could possibly be wrong and and that time I was able to spend a lot of time with her and and she had a, a follow-up visit with like an endocrinologist or something like that and I was able to tell her like listen you want to mention like only the things that are truly bothering you like not totally the um these just like side things so I was really able to focus with her on like hey, these are the three things I really want you to talk to the endocrinologist about. These are your like things that are really important to tell them. These are the things like, don't even get into that. It won't go well. Um, and so she was really appreciative. She was like, I just never knew how to like make them listen to me basically. And so um, I think that was interesting. I think um, in, um, it's kind of an obscure reference, but Malcolm Glad Gladwell's book, I don't remember what it's called. It's one of his books. But anyways, he talks about even um, looking at like how kids are raised and how much of an impact that has on their ability to communicate with medical professionals that, you know, anytime you have a, a mom or a dad that's in the office and communicating with a doctor, that that's the blueprint that that kid is learning for how to communicate with a healthcare professional. And so um, that it, 
it's again not a simple a simple question at all. Um, I think I think it leads to huge disparities. I can think of like you know I've taken care of a lot of trans patients and one trans guy came in he had done all the research online he knew like all the vocabulary he knew what he was asking for he knew how to exactly describe his feelings all that and then I had another patient who had really poor health literacy and he came in and it just looked like he wanted testosterone and I was like oh like you know tried asking how long you felt like a guy and is it impacting you and you know trying to get down to the diagnosis of gender dysphoria and he was like, no, it's fine. Like, everything's fine. I was like, well, how am I going to get this guy testosterone? I'm like, he's not telling me what I need to hear to be able to, to give him what he needs. And then finally, I was like, well, like, how about when you're out and about? And he's like, oh, I don't leave the house. Like, well, why don't you leave the house? And he's like, because people call me a girl and it makes me so sad. Um, and so it was just like heartbreaking that you have one person who's educated themselves so well online because they were empowered and everything and then another person who honestly if I had been rushed or not like in a place to be able to stop and talk to him I might have been like I'm sorry like you don't meet criteria for this diagnosis I can't give you testosterone but once we started down that road he totally did um so I don't know that that's adding any solutions but I completely agree with you that it is a huge problem um on the, I did want to mention one more thing that's completely off topic, and I apologize if I'm running out of time, but um, I think with um, the Trump administration and all the horrific things we saw happen with immigration and the border, and then with Black Lives Matter, I feel like a lot of people did a good job of educating themselves about some of the issues that Latino patients and that Black patients face, and, and we have all those numbers. Um, I really honestly, as myself had not done a good job of educating myself about the history of Native Americans in healthcare. And I, I think that that is, um, I ended up reading a book called The Night Watchman um, and it just kind of illuminated how little I knew. So I would, I think that's for some reason just a blind spot that a lot of people have. And so I would encourage people to read more on the history because all those things that you're mentioning about forced sterilizations and, um, it's just a really, a really sad but powerful history to read. So I would encourage people to take the time. Yeah, I think, I think as public health practitioners or those involved in the field, we really owe it to ourselves and and those that we're working with to become educated on the the history of the United States and how many of these things are are really baked into the system. As I said. Um, we are not quite running out of time. We are going to end at 1.15. So I want to make sure we have time for our final question. But adding in um, another question, uh, I know Lori is jumping off and Erin is able to step in. For Erin and, um, and Dr. Cordobiti, any other recommended reading that you want everyone on this call to read, watch, um, podcasts, listen to, what What are the things that you've been um, consuming lately on media that has helped inform your work? Okay, well, I haven't read it yet, but I'm about to read Embracing Equity um, by Dr. Janine Hill. Um, and we're going to have a great discussion about it. I actually learned about it at City Match, um, my city leaders program. So um, we're really going to be talking about describing where our workplace is in respect to racial equity. Um, and then um, kind of just applying concepts. So that's um, really something that um, you might want to look into. Um, so this also, I didn't even know my own history because <laughs> it's not taught in schools or anything. I just know my people were made to walk here and that's it. So, um, I think it's definitely something that's hard to get your hands on. Like I just learned since I, I think I started really getting a lot of this information, like the forced sterilization, things like that in undergrad. Um, and I was really involved with the American Indian Student Association and this really that peer to peer and, you know, some people um, came from boarding schools and they teach those things. 
Um, and so I learning from them and what the history they were taught and um, just really going through this weird process of the injustice and things I had no idea that happened and why the things are set up or even why um, certain behaviors are in my family. And so with those historical traumas, I think we're seeing that a lot and that word's tossed around a lot and, and, and I hope it doesn't lose its power, but I mean, it's real thing. And um, really having to go through those things, I uh, went through a class um, during my master's my master's anyway so uh ou has a social uh, certificate of social work with american indians and so i took that um and uh, it had a couple of other classes but it really focused on social work i mean but it kind of translates public health and social work we kind of use different terms but uh we uh had a lot of readings i'm trying to think what was it like Healing the soul wound was one. Um, I'm trying to think what else. There were some other ones I have in my list of a cart. Like the, there's one where they interviewed this, this um, native man about his experience in the boarding schools. And so um, just really understanding that, like even down to me personally, uh, we have what's called eight by 10 and uh, where you basically can get a printout and it shows your your ancestors and how they documented their uh, certificate you know their blood and um, I noticed that my name I I recently got married and I, my name used to be camp and I noticed that my name didn't start out at camp it was Hiatcha but um, I don't know what happened there so that's lost and a lot of my family you know have passed on and I've tried to ask uh, a couple of tribal leaders um, that are really involved in the community and you know they couldn't really give me a, a, an answer, but I did find uh, my great grandpa's name on the boarding school in Mekasuki Mission they used to have out there in the area and uh, that burnt down a long time ago, so I have no idea. I don't know if my, um, which was a tradition, usually they did this, is they would change the last name when they were in the boarding schools and they come out differently. So it's just, I wanna say that, um, yeah, you have to try to, to understand this stuff, even for me as um, a native person. And um, it's me going through that class and reading these things and seeing these uh, videos is really hard to swallow. But um, uh, there's stuff like this, a lot of so good social work books. Um, and then just like a comic relief, but almost, I mean, that can get pretty sad too. But um, Reservation Dogs has been really cool to watch and it being an oak mogi and seeing a lot of local people in it and uh you know indigenous act actors and actresses so that's been really cool it's pretty funny i don't know if you'll understand it i know my husband he's he's cattle comanche in delaware and he has some of his friends at work watch it who are non-native and they'll ask him questions or there'll be something weird that happened in it and he'll be like i don't know that's my wife's people but <laughs> yeah that's kind of a cool um cool show to watch and it does um kind of does insert some of those issues like suicide things like that so that's kind of a cool show to watch that it's on season two right now and if you got hulu that's what i do but yeah yeah and i think you make a great point too of of what is the media that we're consuming not just for education and professional development purposes, but what is what is the stuff that we're watching for fun? And are we getting outside of our own narrow bubbles? And are we consuming media that is telling Native stories created by Native people? Are we consuming media that is telling Black stories created by Black people and, and really using that as a as a way to look at what we are are watching and and consuming and in, in every facet of our lives so we have about 15 minutes left i'm gonna try to get in two more questions for everyone i think lily beth brinkman has has put this great comment into the chat and i'll try to sum it up as much as i can but why if someone were to ask you why should i pay for you know, why are we subsidizing insurance for folks or, or why do I care 
um, that we have these disparities in our nation and in our state. What is your what is your response to them? Why why should someone care? I think it it makes sense to us all on the call, but if if you're confronted with that in your day to day, what is what is your response? I actually think I mean I think that gets to the whole heart of the issue. Unfortunately, I think um, you know we kind of. Um, it's just tough to tough to say, but I think we tell our kids a lot of times that you want to treat everybody equally and that everybody's equal. And then there's this hesitation when you actually go to put equality into policy. And I think um, the last, you know, 10 years politically to me has, has highlighted that, that we want it, we don't want it equal. We want it that our own families have the leg up and when you look at actually implementing policies that create equality, it's not popular. Um, and so I think there's some real having to having to call the problem what it is. I think the schools discussion is so relevant. I think it's it's just insane when you look at like schools ratings and again think about that's not good enough for my kid. Well, why is it good for the 400 kids that go to that school? Um, and then how do we? look at those kids who we know we gave a worse education to and act like they were given the same choices that, you know, the school gives that I put my kids into. And so um, I think those are difficult, but really important conversations to have. Um, I think, I think in some ways I've been able to have this discussion, which sounds a little bit odd, but, you know, there's good research coming out that no two kids are raised in the same home, right? Like I have twins and even I know that I'm not raising my twins the same, like one of them has like a really high pitched cry and I will do anything to make that cry stop. And the other one has like a low pitched cry and she gets to cry it out. Like there's just no two kids are raised in the same home. And I think um, in some ways, if you can even like elicit that level of understanding of like, you know, I may be encouraging one twin in one area more than the other one, and then you look at like, oh my gosh, how much greater is that when we look at what schools kids are in, what positions they're seeing, what care they're receiving, how they're treated just based on how they look, um, and just that the United States is not equal um, for people. So to me, I think discussing it more um, upfront, I think this is not a religious discussion, but I think for some reason religion gets brought into that a lot, which confuses me even more. Um, but I, I think it really just has to come back to, you know, we want to believe in the United States that we treat everybody equally and that's not equal. Yeah, I love bringing it back to that, that value and adding in that personal, that personal example of, of you know, you're going to be treating even twins within the same family a little bit differently, even though you're trying to treat them as equally as possible and give them the same opportunities. Erin, any thoughts on what you might say for someone who asks that question? Why, why do I care if I'm doing okay? Well, um, just like Beck Becky said in the comments, like when one part of our population is not doing well, the other part suffers too. I mean, if a family has a preterm baby and, you know, that the cost of that is $65,000, they're um, suffering emotionally, physically, financially, um, they're not going to work as much. So then their job suffers and the whole society just kind of, um, you know, um, ripples um, kind of form. And so even one step closer to equality is going to get people um, on the same playing field and so that we can all be supported. Yeah. Dr. Quirtipiti? It's kind of hard. I mean, it's our culture, right? American culture is individualistic. How's that going to help me? Um, <laughs> and it's really hard. Culture is a hard one. And um, even down to the misconceptions and things about groups of people. I mean, we hear that all the time. Um, 
there's this weird thing where, you know, natives get everything for free and you don't deserve it. You don't deserve to be here in these circles. Uh, it was just given to you because you're native and you fit a box and they made sure you, you got here. Um, so I, uh, it's kind of hard to do because um, I fight my own battles with just me as an individual um, with trying to be in spaces where I'm not normally at. And, um, and I think if we, I mean, if we could see it right now with all the stuff with the compacts with gaming and, you know, I saw how casinos was uh, described. I can't remember who said it, but basically casinos are ways for tribes not to tax their own citizens. And um, casinos, you'll see a lot of like commercials on how they, you know, they utilize those funds and things like that to put back into the communities, build roads, stuff like that. Um, so that is a community wide thing, like not just one person is receiving the benefits, not just tribal citizens are receiving the benefits of that one thing. And I'm not sure how we show that and share that if we all do better you know, if we focus on equity, not everybody starts at the same place. Uh, we don't have all the same opportunities. We don't have the same social networks that we know in the social capital to vote and make sure things like environmentally or, you know, even in the environmental justice area that where we can leverage that social capital to make sure like we can protect our community from environmental uh, exposures. So I, I'm not quite sure that's a, that's a big battle, but it's necessary. I don't and we have to care about one another and um, I know that's in the thing where you had a question on here is um, what do healthcare providers consider when working with native populations and my thing is like what popped in my mind is you know the whole family is a part of that wellness and that visit and you know COVID kind of did some interesting things but you know when somebody's in in the <laughs> hospital the whole family's there we take up the whole waiting room so um i think that's a good opportunity to make sure that we're treating the whole family the whole family as well it's not just one person because we know that even when nutrition-based you know diseases we need to make sure that everybody's making that change or else it's kind of like a uphill battle so i mean we got a lot of work to do <laughs> yeah yeah and that that brings us to our our final question we've we've talked a lot about heavy things today. We we put resources in the chat to look into them more. Um, what gives you hope working in maternal health in Oklahoma? What what keeps you going? Dr. Cordovity, let's start with you. Um so it probably goes back to growing up, my family had this little motto and it was like make every generation better. So that is that sticks with me. Like, I want to make every generation better. Every, every day we're seeing a new, you know, we were even seeing a birth of a, of a new grandbaby, you know, uh, that's where I find hope is just making sure that every generation, uh, it's, it's a little bit better for them. Yeah. Dr. Arnold, what about you? I think honestly calls like this make a big difference. And, um, just seeing, you know, you see so much of the bad on the news and everything, and you hear the legislation coming out and it gets announced and, and all that. And so I think it's so easy to get inundated with the bad. And so I think seeing people who are really trying to improve things for the people of Oklahoma is really inspiring. And that includes all, all these people on this call. Yeah, absolutely. Erin, any, any thoughts on what gives you hope? Well, Dr. Arnold pretty much uh, stole my thunder on that one, but um, the people that are in this field in Oklahoma are very passionate about helping women receive the care they deserve. Um, the community is small but mighty, you know, and um, I think um, with Oklahoma having these poor outcomes for such a long time, you know, we're typically in the bottom of every health ranking list. Um, but I, I see that changing in the future with a lot of initiatives going on in the state with our um, postpartum extension, um, doula care coming, um, team birth, lots of great things that are going on, um, and just people having these difficult conversations are what's going to move it forward. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. This was a great discussion. I know this is the thing that gives me hope is, is talking to you guys and hearing about the work that is happening um, both on the very large systems level down to the individual patient level. Um, so really excited to be a part of this conversation and, and learn from you all. Um, obviously, we could keep talking about these subjects. We have so much rich conversation that is in the chat. Um, but otherwise, I will turn it back over to Heidi to close us out. Wow, I'm just sitting here writing, writing, writing. And I have to tell you, I kind of had a little bit of tears here in there um, when Becky said, there's a big difference between equality and equity. We do not start out from the same starting point. Um, it is a privilege to be able to work in this space, um, to be able to work with families at oftentimes um, when they are at their most vulnerable. Um, the work that you all are doing, our panelists um, and our moderator, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being available. Um, it is so refreshing in today's environment to be able to um, talk so open and freely um, with physicians, Dr. Arnold. Um, and um, we know that, um, we know that, um, being a woman and being um, a girl um, in Oklahoma, um, that Oklahoma does not treat um, our women and girls um, like they should be treated. Um, and so with that, I'm going to ask Becky Mantle, our COBA chair, um, to, to sign us off. Um, but I personally want to thank each of you because when I reached out to you, um, to invite you to be on this panel, um, you all said yes. And um, if you, you've touched a lot of people today, but if there's one person that walks away with something that they're going to put um, in their toolbox to mentor to the next generation, um, we thank you all. So again, um, on behalf of Coalition of Oklahoma Breastfeeding Advocates, um, we are honored to, to have you on our team. Thanks for that, Heidi, and thanks to all the work of pulling this together. Um, Heidi was definitely the behind the scenes um, magician back there. And um, I think um, kind of, yeah, tying into what you just said, I think what one of COBA's values is empowering families, um, but it's apparent just in listening to everybody here and the challenges that we face and our last question of what gives you hope, we give each other hope. And, you know, we can leave this uh, session today and you go out and empower somebody else. Hopefully we've empowered you to hang in there, keep going, fight the good fight. We are doing a lot of good things and go vote next week. Um, I will leave, put one thing on your radar um, in, in the concerns that our state faces. Our legislature in uh, February, we will have bills introduced to outlaw any kind of transgender care. Um, they've already outlawed it at OU and they are gonna try to put legislation through to once again, tell doctors how to provide medical care to their patients. So if you care about that, please go vote and otherwise um, keep, keep fighting the good fight and empower um, uh, empower anyone that you're working with to uh, stay stay the course with us. So, um, and Aaron, did you have that's something? You had your hand up there for a second. So, no. Oh okay. no, sorry. Okay. All right. Well, thanks to everybody for joining us today, and um, stay safe. All right. Thank you. Bye. -bye.